All right. The Lord has led me in my heart to bring a message entitled Fighting Battles for the Next Generation. Fighting Battles for the Next Generation. I want us to read. We've read the verse already this week, but I want us to read it again in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 24. You want to turn there with me. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 14 and verse 24. Words that God said about Caleb. <clears throat> but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereinto he went and his seed shall possess it. I wonder this evening, how many of you in this room are first generation Christians? Let me see your hands of you parents. First generation Christians. Very good. How many of you are second generation Christians, but you would say you're crutching along pretty much? As a second generation Christian, let me see your hands. Okay. Very good. Some time ago, I was meditating upon this verse here. And Caleb is one of my heroes. So I enjoy parking on these verses in the Old Testament. Joshua and Caleb, as they were the two men who stood the test when they were sent into the promised land. But I was meditating upon this verse and the life of Caleb, and it dawned on me in the middle of my meditations what God was saying about Caleb's children. <clears throat> I knew that Caleb fought many battles to take Mount Hebron. In fact, Mount Hebron was covered with giants, and Caleb fought many battles to take Mount Hebron but I realized that his children would inherit what he fought for. And immediately, the connection was made in my own heart and my own mind. Now, the land of Canaan is an Old Testament type of the New Testament abundant Christian life. We know that the Christian life is full of battles, victories, and peaceable fruit that come after the battles and the victories. As I think of all the things that we have heard thus far this week, it seems fitting to me this evening to take a look at the task ahead with an attitude of faith and confidence and belief in God that God surely will do for us exceedingly abundantly what we would even ask or think. I agree with David when he was about to slay the giant for the glory of God, and some of his brothers criticized him, he simply said these words, Is there not a cause? And this evening, my dear parents, I would say the same words to you. Is there not a cause to rise up and fight the battles that, are, that are, lie ahead of us for the sake of the next generation? I believe there is a cause. The children shall possess what the parents have fought for in the Christian life. I'll explain what that means as we move through the message. Looking again in Numbers, I want you to notice that we, this verse, we're breaking into the middle of a conversation between Moses and God. And Moses is trying to convince God to not forsake the children of Israel to pardon them for the things that they've done wrong because they just fell in unbelief and didn't go into the promised land. In verse 17, we, we enter into the middle of that conversation. And, and Moses says to God, And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great 
according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, because you do visit. Please pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this thy people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Now you may wonder, now why did he throw a verse like that in there in the middle of this conversation between God and Moses? I believe this is the reason. God, God's heart came out there. God's heart was, oh, that the whole earth would be filled with my glory, with my knowledge. Oh, that my people would believe me, that would go in and enjoy the blessings that I provided for them. I believe that's what God's heart is saying here. Because all those which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall they, any of them that provoke me, see it. But my servant Caleb... And then we get into the verse which we've read already. I see in this verse a spirit of faith and victory. I see in this man, Caleb, the spirit of a pioneer. Caleb has a fighting spirit. We'll read a little bit later toward the end of the message what kind of a heart and attitude he had. I mean, when he spoke those words, those famous words that people have written songs about where he said, I want that mountain. He was 85 years old when he said those words. He wasn't a spring chicken. He wasn't a 25-year-old enthusiast dreaming a bunch of dreams. This is an old man, 85 years old, and he was full of grit, and he was full of the grace of God when he was 85 years old. And he said, that mountain that I saw that God promised to Moses for me, I want it, and I'm going to have it. God said, I'm going to have it, and I'm going to have it. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, God said you're going to have it. And if you'll rise up and say, I'm going to have it, you'll have it. You will. That's the word of the Lord. God liked the heart of Caleb. A heart that wholly followed God. God still likes hearts like that too, by the way. You know, we have a choice to make with all that we've been listening to all these many, many sessions. And my, you must be about full by now. All these words that have been given to you. But we have a choice to make what we're going to do with all that we're hearing. We have a choice to make. And I believe what God is saying to us is that our hearts should rise up in faith and seize the promises that God has been giving to us. And with a, with a heart like Caleb say, I see that mountain and I'm going to have it. And guess what? If you will rise up and do that, your children shall possess what you were willing to fight for. But my dear fathers and mothers, the other is also true. That if we do not fight for that piece of land, our children probably won't get any. <clears throat> if we drop in on Hebron in the days of Caleb's possession, it's a very interesting scene. You'll find war on Mount Hebron in the days of Caleb. You hear the noise of battle. You hear the strong cries of men crying out to God and women crying out to God. You hear and see the strain of the reality of a war that's going on. You'll see giants all over the mountainside of Mount Hebron. But if you drop into Mount Hebron 20 years after that, you will see a very, very different scene. You'll see houses. You'll see vineyards. You'll see sheep on the hillsides. 
You'll see children running and playing by the side of the house. You'll see a garden over here, and mom and the older children are working in it. You'll see a field out there, and dad's out there with the older boys, and he's working in it. There's fences up. There's, all, uh, there's olive trees growing, and everything is beautiful. And there's a house over here, and another house over here. And you could stand back and look at it and say, My, this looks beautiful. It's hard to imagine that somebody fought the giants around here 20 years ago. But the fact and the, real, and the reality is exactly that. Because Caleb was willing to rise up and believe God and believe God's promise and go after that mountain and face the battles and face those giants and deal with them the way they needed to be dealt with. Because Caleb was willing to do that. He wholly followed the Lord and he wholly believed the Lord. There sits all of Caleb's children there on the mountainsides in all these houses and they just simply inherited this beautiful mountain called Hebron to live on. They didn't have to fight a lick for it. Selah. <clears throat> There's something very stirring that uh, goes on inside of my heart when I begin to think about fighting the battles for the next generation. Something challenging that stirs inside of me. Something adventuresome. You know, for first generation Christians, there's something stirring about reading an account like this and realizing that if I will, in fact, chart a course, my children will inherit some things that I never had. All you first generation Christians, pay attention. Now Canaan is a picture of the abundant Christian life. And the abundant Christian life, dear brothers and sisters, has meat on it. It's not just a good feeling. It has meat on it. The abundant Christian life is a life of victory. The abundant Christian life is a life of prosperity as we live by the principles of the Word of God. The abundant Christian life is a happy marriage. The abundant Christian life is a joyful home. The abundant Christian life is a life of service for God. The abundant Christian life is all of those things and yet much more that is the land <clears throat> mom and I we started with nothing 30 years ago we started with nothing we are first generation Christians and we came from the bottom of the barrel no teaching, no light, no understanding, no example whatsoever. Just a couple hippies sitting on the floor smoking marijuana. But God had mercy upon us. But 30 years ago, we didn't have very much land, I'll tell you that. But you know what we did 30 years ago? We stood together and we gazed out over the land and we said, Oh, Look at that one over there. Look at that nice hillside over there. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Oh, yes, we would like that. Yes, we would like that. A happy marriage. Yes, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to do this marriage thing. But do you see that beautiful piece of land over there? Let's go for that one, honey. Let's go for that one. We stood on the good side of the River Jordan and gazed out over the land and desired many beautiful plots. And, and uh, we started to um, move in that direction. Now, when we started, we were pretty insecure. We were pretty ignorant. I was pretty introverted. <clears throat> but somehow, God stirred our hearts to believe that even somebody like us could inherit some of that land. And you know, it took a few years for us to get a grasp on the reality that as we gained those pieces of land, it would also fall upon our children as a blessing that we never had. And you know, though at times, you know, it's a little difficult to see the children enjoying the blessings that you never had, 
But you know, I wouldn't change it, not one bit at all. I wouldn't change it for my dear children who are possessing things that we fought to get. <clears throat> we said to the Lord, O oh Lord, we see some of it, and God, we want these things. Now when I say we had a fight for everything we get, this is what I mean by fight. We had the fight of humility facing the needs, the many needs which kept coming up again and again and again in our uneducated Christian lives. We had the fight of prayer and wrestling on our knees over our failures and the things that we wanted God to do in our lives. We had the fight of faith, of rising up and believing that even God would do such a thing for us in our lives. We had the fight of not giving up at times when things didn't go too well and we were tempted to give up and just throw the whole thing. We fought our way through those things because we saw a piece of land that we wanted to have and we wanted our children to enjoy it in ways that we never did. All you first generation Christians in this room, that's where your attitude should be tonight. I want that mountain, oh God, for my children. I want them to live in that nice little house over there with a fence around it. And I'm not talking about a physical one, bless God, with a white picket fence around it. We had the fight of joining hands and engaging the enemy as we realized this fella is set to destroy us in any way he can. We will not let him do it. That's the fight I'm talking about. We came into the Christian life, me, I'm speaking personally about me, very undisciplined and lazy. Marriage, it didn't go too well. Children, we didn't do that very well. We had a lot to learn. Leadership, I didn't know much about leadership. I had Sergeant Denny kind of leadership mentality in my mind when we entered into this whole thing. Fellowship, mama didn't understand very much about that. Finances, we struggled quite along. How long of a list do you want? But we looked at all that and we looked at the land and we said, that land is for us. God promised us that land and we're going to go get it for our children. That's what we said. Think about it. The children, the children are literally possessing what we fought for. You think about it. I was a lazy man. When I got converted, I was lazy. No doubt about it. That was part of my character. That's the way I was. But I faced my laziness. I went through the humiliation of facing my laziness. I sat in the office and let the fellow at UPS sit me down and tell me a thing or two and tell me that if you don't straighten out, boy, you're going to lose your job. I suffered the humili humiliation of that. I went through many things. I wept tears. I cried out to God. I said, God, change me. I don't want to be a lazy man. Even the boss told me I'm lazy. I don't want to be lazy. It doesn't glorify you. You've got to change me, Lord. I don't want to be a lazy man. Guess what? I am not a lazy man. Hallelujah. God gave me victory. Guess what? My boys, they just inherited that piece of land. It's never been a big struggle to them. They don't hardly know the difference between the one or the other because they're around a papa who's full of diligence and full of energy and full of things to do. And they just pick all of that up. And it's an inheritance to them. They don't even have to work for it. They don't have to fight for it. I mean, it's handed to them on a silver platter because mom and dad fought for it. That's what I'm talking about tonight, dear fathers and mothers. Fighting battles that our children may inherit things that we really had to fight for. And they just get them. They just get them. See, that's not fair. Oh, hang on a while. Hang on a while. It's worth it. It's worth it. Before I got converted, I, hate to, I hated children. Now... I love children. And guess what? All my children love children. 
that never even passed their mind to hate them. Before I was converted, I hated old people. Guess what? Now I love them and respect them, and my children love and respect old people. They never faced one little battle about old folks one time in their life. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. Before I was converted, I was full of insecurity, and I was a very, very negative man. Ah, when it rained, I wished it was sun was shining, and when the sun was shining, I wished it would rain. My children dwell in an atmosphere of faith and confidence at our house. Why? Because we were willing to face the issues in our life before God and recognize that part of the abundant Christian life, part of a spirit-filled life, is for God, by His grace, to come in and change us. That's the sanctification process in the Christian life. And God comes in and changes us. And guess what? The children just grow up in a totally different atmosphere than what we had before them. We fight for it, and they just possess it. Just as simple as that. Oh, Dad Caleb marched up that mountain and dealt with those giants. And after he passed off the scene, all the children and the children's children of Caleb just dwell peaceably on Mount Hebron as if there was never a giant there before. That's what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Paul spoke of these very, this very principle as he was encouraging Timothy. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said these words. Let no man despise thy youth, Timothy. But be thou an example of the believers in word, conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of my hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, Timothy. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting or thy pioneer advance or every new piece of ground that you gain may appear unto all. That's what Paul is saying to Timothy right there. That word profiting is the word of advancing forward. That word profiting is a word, it's a positive word of sanctification in the life of the believer. And Paul was telling Timothy, look boy, you're young, you're not an old man yet, don't let him despise your youth, meditate on these things, give attendance to reading, and every advance you make will appear unto all. They will see it and say, look how God is changing that man. That's what we're talking about this evening. We take all these things that God has been doing, the things that He's been ministering to us, the things that we're learning about our home, the things that we're learning about ourselves, and you know, it's a lot of things to sit and listen to for a whole week. You know, you could give yourself over to discouragement sitting here thinking, wow, this is way more than I can ever handle. I want to change the way you look at it. You look at it like a beautiful piece of land sitting over here with green grass on it. And God is saying, that is for you. There's such a difference between that attitude and the other one that says, Oh my, what am I going to do? How am I going to do all these things? I'm overwhelmed by all the things this guy is telling me. No, you're not looking at it right. That's exactly the way the other ten spies and all the rest of the children of Israel looked at the land of Canaan. They looked at it all and said, Oh, the cities are big and the mountains are big and the people are strong and the giants are tall and there's too many things going on in there. It's too much for me. Well, God says to them, then just go die in the wilderness if you want to. But my servant Caleb, my servant Caleb, there was another spirit in him. He wholly followed the Lord. Him, I'm going to give him, I'm going to let him have the piece of land that I said he's going to have. And his children will possess it after him. After he's gone, it will be theirs. See, we're talking about changing our heritage. All us first generation Christians. We're talking about changing our heritage. This evening. Now we all know what a pioneer is. Don't we? We live in America. 
There was a day when there were pioneers in America. The pioneers were the ones who said, being on the east side of the United States, I'm going west. The pioneers were the first ones that went. A pioneer, you know, a pioneer, they're the ones who build the first raft so all the rest of the wagons can float over that river when they come to it. That's what a pioneer is. Picture the pioneer. Just get a little picture. Dad, mom, and two little ones heading out to go from the east side of the United States to the west side of the United States. That's what God is calling us to do. Not to go from the east side of the United States to the west. But God is saying, here you are in a certain place. Maybe you don't know very much. Maybe there are lots of needs in your life. Maybe you feel overwhelmed by all the things that you've heard all this week. I want you to get in that wagon, put your little ones in that wagon, and set your sights on where you're going. God is saying to us this evening, do not despair, believe in me. Do not despair, believe my promises. Do not go by the sight of your eye, nor by some of the experiences that you may face, but believe me, I want to give you the land that I've been laying before you all this week. I want to give you a godly home, and I will give you one if you will keep on going, if you will believe me, if you will trust me, if you you will take all the things that I'm giving you and rise up and believe them with all of your heart and chart a new course for your family. You, with your wife and those little ones, will make it over to the other side into California. That's what God is saying to us tonight. Now, some are going to make it, but some are not going to make it. Some are going to get discouraged. Some are going to sit back and say, it's too much for me. I can't handle it. Some may... Pa may, uh, may uh, pitch their tent just on this side of the Jordan River and leave all the land sit out there for somebody else. And that's up to you, every single one of us. We all have those decisions we have to make. But I just want you to know tonight, brothers and sisters, you're making those decisions before a holy God. You're making them before a living God. You're making them before a God that you will stand before someday and you'll have to answer for the decisions that you make. But God is saying to us tonight, God is ministering to us tonight. God is saying, have faith, believe in me. Look at that mountain, believe it. I promise you, it is yours. I will give it to you. You can have it if you want it. That's what God is saying tonight. Fighting battles for the next generation. The pioneer treads new ground. He settles a new area. He goes on before, before anyone else goes. There's something stirring and adventuresome in me about a pioneer. There's something inside of me that stirs me when I think those kind of thoughts. And by the way, it stirred me 30 years ago too. Bless God, I looked at all and said, Amen. We're going to go for it, Mom. We're not going to sit over here. We're not going to live in this pup tent on the edge of the Jordan River. Look at that nice house sitting over there. And I'm not talking about the house I'm living in. I'm talking about that spiritual house over there. Look at that beautiful piece of land over there. See those cattle out there on the thousand hills over there? Let's go for that, Mama. Let's do something that will affect our children and bless our children after us. Bless God, when we're dead and gone, they'll have something that we never had before. Let's do it, Mom. Come on. Get on this side of this old wagon. Children, hop in the back. We're going. There's something very adventuresome about taking new ground for the sake of the children. Now, I think we ought to take it just for the sake of the glory of God. But it's all right to have a few other motivations in our lives. Amen. It's, it's all right, and there's something stirs my heart to take new ground for the children, for the children's sake. <clears throat> you know, some time ago, we had a healthy exercise in family devotions. Once I spent some time meditating upon this verse, and I realized the riches that were in it, and I realized, ah, that's exactly what we've been doing. That's what we've been doing all these years. I sat the family down and we had a little devotion out of this verse. And I opened it up for a family discussion during family devotions. And I said to the, to the children, what do you 
possess that you know that mom and dad fought for. Now that was an interesting discussion. Very interesting. As the children opened up and began to share their mind, their memories, they went back. And some of the older children, they went back to struggles in the home that they remembered that they were there. But, oh, it was a beautiful exercise that we had. It opened up beautiful discussion. Words of gratitude came forth out of the children. Words of support. I mean, they fueled our fire and said, Mom and Dad, the things that we have because you were willing to fight. Keep on going. Just keep on going. Don't stop where you are. Words of encouragement and support came from the children. It was very inspiring. And they encouraged us to keep on possessing more of the beautiful land that God has for us. And guess what? We don't plan to stop yet. Amen. We're not done. We, there's a whole lot more land to possess and we're not done. There's many more things. There are needs in our lives. We want God to deal with those needs. There's a piece of land over there that I want. And God's going to give it to me. And I'm not going to slow down. Bless God. There's too many beautiful things out there. Abundant things. Beautiful things. Fruitful things in the Christian life that I want to possess yet. And guess what? My children, they will get it after me. Very inspiring meditation we had. Some of the observations that I noticed in that discussion, I wrote them down afterwards. I was intrigued. The small children, they didn't know a lot. They just, you know, they didn't know a lot. Some of the discussions that we had, they couldn't even relate to it. They just live in a happy home. And that's it. You know, it's just, what? What are you talking about? You mean mom and dad used to have words with each other? What are you talking about? They just live in a happy home. But the older children, they knew. They knew. Yeah, there's been some struggles working through this piece of land over here called a happy marriage. But the little children, what? What are you talking about? That's what they said. And I looked at it and said, yeah, there it is already. They are possessing something. They don't even have a clue how we fought, what we did in order to obtain that sweet and happy atmosphere in the home. The older children, they were full of gratitude. They remembered some of the battles for many of the areas of land in our Christian lives that we dealt with. And they were full of gratitude as they looked at them and realized, you humbled yourself. You dealt with those issues. You went through some humiliating experiences. You didn't quit. You got up again when things didn't go right. And now you have something and we just have it right here in our own hands. They were filled with gratitude. I'm telling you, fathers and mothers, your children will kiss you. They will bless you. They will love you. They will respect you and honor you if you will rise up by the grace of God and take the bull by the horns and deal with some of these issues in your life and get through to God on them. Your children will rise up and bless you for it. I'm telling you, they will. Because what you fight for, they shall receive them so beautifully. They shall be theirs. They won't have anything to worry about. It won't be a big deal to them at all. But they will look at it and realize, Mom and Dad went through the fire for these. And they will rise up and they will bless you for them. Yes. Worthy is the lamb. Hallelujah. Yes. Worthy is a lamb. <clears throat> Another observation that I had as we were discussing there and sharing and listening to the children, this question came to my mind. Have we stopped fighting for more land? Have we stopped fighting for more land? We don't want to stop fighting for the land. There's much more land to possess yet. We're not going to give up that easy. We're not going to settle down. We're not going to say, okay, we got a few pieces of land. Here, children, have a happy marriage. Have this. That's all we're going to have. You, you go get the rest yourself. We're done. We decided we're not going to go that way. We're going to keep on moving forward. <clears throat> Another observation that I found, which has blessed my heart. The older children can join in the fight with you. They can join in. <clears throat> For the new ground that lies ahead, the older children, they, the children, they rose up. 
I mean, those older children, they just stood beside us and, and blessed us for all the land that we obtained. And they encouraged us and said, go get some more. We're with you. We'll help you. We'll pray for you. We'll stand with you. We'll support you. Go get some more. God bless those older children for that. Maybe some of you older children don't want your mom and dad to go get some more. I would encourage you, don't resist your mom and dad if they're gazing at another piece of land over there. Don't you resist them. They're looking at something that God wants them to have because it's in this book right here. I don't know what that piece of land may be, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of lovely pieces of property there in the land of Canaan for all who are willing to fight and believe God and possess them. <clears throat> and the last observation that I had as we had this discussion was this. You, if you will grasp the vision that I'm giving you right now, you can enlist your whole family in this pursuit. It doesn't have to just be a mom and dad thing. You can sit your family down and say, Okay, children, this is the next piece of property that we are going to go after. Let's all go get it together. You can enlist your family to help you in these things and join them in the pursuit of more land in your life. Listen to me now. Just consider. This land is worth fighting for. It's worth fighting for. A happy marriage is worth fighting for. Amen. I'm telling you, Amen. you don't know what you do for your children if you can leave for your children a happy marriage. You don't know what you do for the next generation, for the establishment of the homes of your children, if you can gain that piece of land which is called a peaceable, happy marriage in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a treasure it is for you. If you don't have that, if you go after it and get it, it's worth fighting for, I'm telling you. It's worth it. If you're not there, I want to encourage you. Don't stop. Do not stop until you have a happy marriage. Amen. One of the greatest gifts that you can give your children is a happy marriage. Don't stop. Don't stop. An orderly, godly home. Think about that one for a moment. You bring all these things into place in order the children grow up in the home. What do they see? It's nothing to them. Dad's in his place. Mom's in her place. There's order. There's love. There's direction. There's devotions. Dad's a leader. The boys pick up dad's leadership. Mom's a follower. The girls pick up mom's followership. Everything is in order. The children just grow up and they inherit the whole thing. All that beautiful order. Oh. Oh, that's just normal life. Yeah. Dad leads, mom follows, this, that. Yeah. Oh, that's just normal life. That's the way it's supposed to be. Amen. That's the way it's supposed to be. They just grow up in the midst of all this beautiful order. And that's just the way it is. And that's the only way they ever knew it. And that's the only way they're going to have it. And they start so far ahead of us, you can't imagine. Often I like to say it this way. You know, okay, we took the ball and we started running. Maybe we only made it to seven. But we, we passed the ball on to the children. Maybe the children will make it to nine because we made it to seven and helped them along the way. That's what we're talking about. It's worth fighting for. A disciplined Christian life is something that is very much worth fighting for. You, you fight for it. You bring that thing into your life. You bring that into your home. Ha! Huh, the children. That's the only way it ever was. What? What's so wrong? What's so hard about fasting? Fasting. We've known that ever since we're little. Fasting's not a big deal. How many days do you want to fast? Three? Five? Seven? No, it's no big deal. Getting up in the morning. Oh, that's not a big deal. Getting up in the morning. No big deal at all. You just set the alarm. You just get up. That's all there is to it. Well, what's the big deal? Why is it that way? They inherited it. That's why. They didn't even have to fight for it. 
That's just the way it always was. And that is exactly the way God wants it to be. <clears throat> so, say so. Well, what are they going to do then? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> what are they going to do? Instead of taking 20 years to try to get their life all figured out and straightened out, guess what they're going to do? They're going to go do damage to Satan's kingdom. They're going to blast some, some devils on the other side of the world. They're going to build the kingdom of God. They're going to shoot their arrows into beautiful places that will do damage to Satan's kingdom and glorify the Lord. That's what they're going to do. They don't have to mess around for 20 years trying to get the whole thing all straightened out and figured out. It's already straightened out and it's all figured out. So they're going to go for the gold. That's what they can do. And that's the will of God. So you may look at it all and say, well, well, I want to be a missionary and I want to be this and I want to be that. And, but it just took us too long to get it all together. Hey, you get it all together and your children can fulfill some of those wannabes, one of those dreams, some of those dreams that you had, your children can do for you. Amen? And they'll do them way out ahead, way out ahead of you. Amen? They'll do it way out ahead. Ah, praise the Lord. Let's go over to, uh, just turn the page in Numbers 14 just a little bit. Hear the words of Caleb and Joshua this evening, my dear parents. As you are tempted to feel overwhelmed with all the things that have been given to you, hear the words of Joshua and Caleb. Their words of exhortation to the people who were letting their heavy hands hang down and saying, it's too much for us, in Numbers 14 and verse 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, the land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. That's what Joshua and Caleb said to the people as they tried to still them. Turn also over to Joshua chapter 14. And hear the words of Caleb now. He's 85 years old. And the word of the Lord has been stirring in Caleb's heart for about 40 years, 45 years. I mean, he heard Moses say those words. He heard Moses say, God said, you will have that piece of land that you were on. It's yours, Caleb. It's yours. So this thing's been stirring inside of him all this time. Here is testimony in Joshua chapter 14 and starting in verse 7. Excuse me a moment here. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to espy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. Good word, Caleb. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. And I, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day saying, Surely the land whereupon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. You get that? God just keeps saying those words, and I'm telling you, the land which God is promising you, it shall be inherited by your children when you wholly follow the Lord your God. It shall be yours. Verse 11, he goes on to say, As yet I am as, as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now. Ready for war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore, give me this mountain, 
whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest that in that day how the Anakims are there and the cities of the great are great and fenced. So if so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord God said. Dear brothers and sisters, these are the faith-filled words of a man who believed God and believed God's promises. I believe this evening we need to follow his example with all the things that we've been hearing. And instead of thinking, oh my, this is too much for me. Instead, we need to rise up and say, God, I believe you. Your promises are sure. These things are mine. I will have them. If you will walk in the spirit of those very words, you shall have that and yea, much more than that you shall have.